meeting is being recorded. All right. All right. So good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second Equipping the Saints series for this year. And this uh, this season, right, we are looking at uh, this, uh, the our we're looking at the book of Proverbs and we entitled this uh, series Living Wisely. Uh, so over the next five Wednesdays, you're going to study together uh, very practical issues okay, that reflects God's wisdom in daily living and how we can acquire them for ourselves. Now, and there's no better place to go than the book of Proverbs, of course. Huh? Now, as a way of introduction, uh, allow me to read for us uh, from the very beginning of the book, of the uh, book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 to 7, which tells us why Proverbs is our go-to book to live wisely. All right. Uh, just as a caveat, uh, you might just want to have your Bibles with you because this is something like a Bible study as well, right? So have your Bibles with you as we go through this whole series. Okay. So let me allow me to read for us Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 to 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay, that's uh, verse 1 to 7. And it gives us a very apt description of what the book of Proverbs is all about. So before we begin, let's uh, go come together, commit our time together to the Lord, okay, in prayer. Join me in prayer, please. Father, we pray now that with our Bibles open before us, you will teach us from your words of wisdom, that you will correct us, Train us in the path of righteousness and convict us of all that is displeasing to you and that you will create a genuine desire within us to become not only students of your book, but also those who by your heavenly enabling put into practice what we learned. Save us from just being mere tasters without benefiting from the nutrition of your word. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, come. So what we have today uh, is an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented in world history, right? We know that literacy rates are high globally. And our children and youth seem to be getting a lot of A's, right? Scoring more A's now. And most of us carry little devices in our pockets, right? That enables us at any time uh, to read the greatest work of literature, listen to brilliant minds, access information about history and philosophy or economics or whatever we wish okay we can access to all this and we have we we have what no other generations before us even have dreamt of having right so the intellectual riches at our fingertips are almost embarrassingly bountiful right we have so much okay all of this is great but here's the question for all of us right has this made us any wiser now, I do not mean uh, it has it make it smarter. Okay? I do not mean it, whether it has boosted our overall IQ. No, we are not going to make an absolute... Uh, if we want to make... Uh, do not want to make an absolute uh, mess of our lives. Uh, and if we want to make it through life, okay, we need something more than what we hardly talk to about today. Okay? The, word, the world talks about signs and facts and the moral community, communities like the church, the synagogues, the temples or whatever, they all talk about morality. But actually what we need is something that, that we hardly talk about nowadays, okay? And it's not identical to knowledge and it's not identical even to moral goodness, okay? It's wisdom, okay? It is for this reason that I was led by the Spirit to initiate this study uh, on the book of wisdom for us. Lah. Now, one of the challenges I think uh, some of us would have, you know, some of you have told me also when you try to study the book of wisdom, what it seems like a collection of wise one-liner sayings, you know, which does not seem to have any structure or you going from one verse to another. How is it all connected? And at times, it sounds contradicting as well, right? Some Proverbs, right? Take for example, uh, if you have your Bible, you can check, okay? 
Look at Proverbs 26, verse 4. Proverbs 26, verse 4. What does it say? Answer not a fool according to his folly. Least you be like him. So answer not a fool, right? But look at the next verse. Verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly. Least he be wise in his own eyes. <laughs> so should we answer a fool or and who is the fool, right? So what I have done in our study together, right, for over the next five weeks is to discern some clear practical guidelines to distill God's wisdom in five major life themes, okay, from the book of Proverbs. Okay? Guidelines in relation to living life today, right? And on the onset, I want us to know that our study will deal with some very practical but fundamental issues. Okay, which we will do so across the five weeks. And the live themes are as in the slide. Lah. So today we we'll look at what is wisdom actually, and then why is the fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom? And then we look, the next one, we look at our friends. The following week, we look at our words. And then the, the fourth one, we look at our work and then our wealth. All right. And to help us with our study, I have developed a journal. Lah. You can call it a wisdom journal. For us to help us to better follow with the series. Lah. And you I've also included a daily devotional lah, at the end of the journal to help us reflect what we have actually learned or learned together at each of the session on a day-to-day -day basis. So today, starting tomorrow, you will have a daily devotion, a reflection of what we have actually covered today over the next seven days until we meet again. Okay, so this is uh, something, you, you know, to help us through. La. And if you do not have the journal with you, uh, please get in touch with Audrey and Audrey will uh, make it available to you. Okay, so this, the, this journal will be distributed to you uh, before each of the session. And the slides that I'll be using will be uh, shared after the session. La. Okay, so I hope this is all right for everyone. La. So if any questions, just uh, get in touch with uh, Audrey. La. Okay, so to get us started for this first session, uh, we will look at chapter 8, right? So today we'll look at Proverbs chapter 8 and of course some other supporting uh, verses for the Bible as well. Eh? Uh, and we will see uh, our topic for today is number one is why is wisdom important? Why do we even bother about looking at this, right? And then of course we have to answer that question is what is wisdom? Right. Some of you all have come into this uh, to join it, sign up for this ETS. Probably you might be thinking, trying to learn some nuggets of wisdom and then for your life and all that stuff. Now, is wisdom like something like some rules or some hidden secret that we have to store in our hearts and then, then like that, you know, we can just uh, apply it in our lives and life will get better? Is that what it's all about? Let's see what the Bible say. Okay. What did the Bible say? And why is the biblical definition of wisdom the most relevant and useful uh, definition of wisdom in the world? Uh, okay. And then lastly, uh, using this definition of wisdom from the Bible, we will then lastly look at how can we obtain wisdom, right? No point studying and then, wow, we, we need to know how. Uh, okay. And to understand what it means when the proverb says, uh, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom which we just read uh, a while ago in uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. So we are looking at the why, the what, and the how today. Okay. Now to get us going, let's look at the, uh, like at the passage we are doing. So now what I want to do is to maybe call upon maybe four individuals to help us to read. Uh, I mean five, uh, I think I got five slides. Just read God's word uh, on, on, uh, on just as an introduction. Uh, I will call just at random now. Uh, Maybe uh, Edmund, can you help us read this uh, this slide here? Oh, uh, verse 10, one verse yeah. or what? Yeah, no, take, read the whole, the whole, the whole slide. Oh, okay. was, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, verse 10, take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. Mm. For wisdom is better than jewels. And all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I wisdom dwell with prudent, and I find knowledge and discern the decretion. The fear of the Lord is hated of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speak I had. Thank you, Edmund. Okay. Diana, can I uh, invite you to read for us this one? 
Uh, sure, sure. I, I have I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. Thank you. Thank you. Kampo, can I get you to read for us? Yeah, okay. Thanks. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depth, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Thank you. Uh, Hui Ching, can I get you to read for us, the lady for the night? <laughs> I, I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign, and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule, princes rule and nobles all who govern justly. Thank you. Uh, can then I invite Sister Vivian from the choir to read for us? Take my instruction instead of silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I wisdom dwell with students, and I find knowledge and description. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, sorry, I think I repeated this. Okay, never mind. Huh? Sorry. Thank you so much, everybody. Now, let's look at this, huh? the passage we just read for us, right? Now, the first three verses we just read, right? Uh, I think Vivian just read for us again. Huh? Uh, tells us the importance of wisdom and why we should pursue it. Okay, It's saying that wisdom is infinitely more important than all the wealth, all the fame, and all the power in the world. Because wisdom gives us the ability to grow and handle and flourish the, uh, you know, in all life circumstances. Now, having great opportunity, people say, wow, you're very fortunate. You know, some even use the word lucky, right? The world will use it, right? The world will call it lucky, right? Fame and fortune, power and happiness, you know. It's nowhere, nowhere near as important as wisdom. That's what the Bible tells us, which is the ability to handle and to grow, uh, to grow and to flourish in all kinds of circumstances of life. Now, why is wisdom important then? Because only a tiny minority of people uh, in the world ever get their life uh, in order and the way they want it to be, right? Wisdom is thus more important than all the fame, good looks, you know, opportunities that can, can come to you. Maybe you're born in a rich family and all that stuff. That wisdom is more important than just that, right? And we've seen it before, right? So some people who are inherited riches and wealth doesn't mean necessarily that their life will be smooth. Right? It's wisdom that makes the difference because there are other people who do not have talents, intellectual charisma and everything seem to make, uh, you know, make life well. I mean, have live a good life, you know. And what's the difference? It's because of wisdom. Wisdom makes all the difference. Now, we need to understand uh, that wisdom is not the same as moral goodness or, uh, or, or intellect or something like that, right? Though it's related to it in a way, right? Wisdom is not being less ethical also but far more. For example, uh, if you want to help a poor family, right, uh, out of poverty, and that's good, right? It's morally good, that's no, noble, that's right. But you can do it completely unethical and still ruin their lives, right? They become more so dependent on you, but they do not know how to feed themselves or get themselves, you know, uh, improve their life livelihood. Because if we are not familiar with the complexity of how poverty works in the world, we will get into trouble, right? We're not, instead of helping people, we'll hurt them more. So many decisions in order to make them well, uh, we know that uh, in our life, right? You only require knowledge, right? Some of these decisions, you need more knowledge, you know, uh, what to buy, what, how to fix up your modem in your house. You need to know some information and you, then you can, once you have that information, you can make the decision, right? If you have all the knowledge, you could choose the right car, maybe the right medicine to take or something like that, right? Other decisions are mainly a matter of your principles and your commitments, right? But for the vast majority of decisions in our life, uh, we actually face, uh, all the rules and all the facts uh, will not help you, right? For example, for example, what are some of the life uh, issues that, we, that, that all the rules won't help us? Things like who to marry, uh, 
who should, should you stay single? Who should you date? Right? Do you break up with this person? What career should you go into? What school should you go to? Uh, should I stay here? Should I stay there? Should I confront this person or should I, uh, you know, hold back? Uh, should I take the risk or should I play it safe? Right? You realize that a wrong decision in any of these circumstances, right, will result in disaster. Right? Will result in disaster. Yet the rules don't cover them. Where do you find rules for this kind of things, right? Whatever you think the moral rules are, they don't cover them. And knowledge itself will not be sufficient for you to make this kind of decisions, right? Now, and I think most of us sometimes have this sinking feeling in our stomach, you know, about life. You know, when you are in a situation, you have to make a decision and you find that you don't have the wisdom on how to address it. And that's the problem because it's not a matter of getting more information, more knowledge, or being smarter or being uh, good, right? It's just that you don't have the wisdom, okay? So you, do you see the importance of wisdom, right? So wisdom, that's why the Bible tells us it's more important than all the silver, all the gold, all the jewels and all the opportunities and the maybe the a good uh, maybe pedigree. Uh, uh, it doesn't help you to, to, to you know, to, to have a, to lead a better life, right? In that sense, okay? So the next thing is that's the importance of wisdom. And now we let's look at what how the Bible defines wisdom. Okay. So how does the Bible define wisdom, right? We have already kind of hinted at it. What how, what what does wisdom mean? Let's move down on a text that we just read in Proverbs chapter 8, huh? To verses 12 to 16. Now it might be helpful to open your Bibles and take a look, right? From Proverbs 8, from chapter, I mean from verses 12 to 16. Now let's look at it. First of all, huh? Notice it says, wisdom has insight. Insight, right? Verse 14. That's the Hebrew word of bia, bina, okay? Which actually means knowing how things really work. Knowing how things really happen, okay? Now, secondly, uh, the Bible tells us uh, in this passage, uh, it says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. Verse 12, right? Verse 12. So, this means to notice little distinctions, which means uh, wisdom is knowing how things really are. You're just like a detective. Imagine like a Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you go into a crime scene. You're able to see things right, that other people cannot see. right? So that's wisdom, what the Bible says. And wisdom, so wisdom, uh, the first two things is that knowing how things really happen in the world, how things really work. And wisdom is, secondly, Knowing how things really are. Okay, how things really are. And thirdly, lastly, look at verse uh, look at verse 15, right? By me, kings reign and rulers decree the right things. So wisdom is not just knowing how things really work and how things really are, but also what I should do about it. What I should do about it. Okay. Now in uh, TTC, uh, the seminary which uh, both Pastor Gan and myself uh, were educated. Uh, we were made to study this guy, uh, you know, a, a famous German scholar, which his name is Von Rath. Uh, and he defined wisdom, uh, I, which I found it very helpful. Okay, His Von Rath, uh, you know, defined wisdom as becoming competent with regards to the reality of life. Becoming competent with realities of life. Knowing how things really happen. How things really are and knowing what to do about it. Okay, So Von Rath adds uh, that though the wise have knowledge and the wise have moral character, they also have a character of mind and heart so that they always do the right things even when the rules don't apply. And that's wisdom. Okay? That is wisdom. Okay. Now, now, okay, so now we know what is wisdom, but why do we not have wisdom naturally? Why, why, right? Okay, now, so this is the huge problem here, you know, when it comes to getting wisdom. Why do we don't have it so uh, in, in within ourselves naturally? It's one of the reasons, one, uh, yeah, so look at verse 22 now of chapter eight, 80, uh, 8, right? When he made everything, I was there. Okay, so wisdom says, right, when he made everything, I was there. So here you will understand from the context, the passage, God made everything with wisdom. The Bible says that, right? And I'm sure we know that because we read this many times. 
But what's the implication of it, right? When wisdom made God was wisdom was with God and God made wisdom, right? What does it mean? Uh, made made the whole world. What does it mean? So think about it with me, right? If God created the world according to wisdom, then there is a fabric, okay, a pattern to all of reality. It's not random, huh? Wisdom is not random. If if wisdom made the world, then wisdom, then to have wisdom is to perceive that pattern, okay, to a great great degree and live according to that pattern uh, and live uh, therefore when you can say you can live wisely when you live to the pattern of the world that god has made okay you live wisely okay you can say you can see it being said in the bible repeatedly right uh the the you know how the ways of uh god has uh, weaved this uh into the creation itself we all know that there's a pattern in the physical reality right so take, for example, like the law of gravity. If you throw something down from a 10-story HDB flat, you will certain, certainly know what to expect, right? What will happen, okay? So there is a fabric, uh, there's a pattern to God's spiritual reality. And if your heart, your conscience, your emotions, or, or your hopes uh, of or all work uh, in a way that is not according to this pattern uh, or this fabric, uh, your spiritual life will crash, okay? That's what the Bible tells us. And so foolishness, the fool, uh, is the one who goes against the grain and the pattern God has put into creation. Okay? Which always lead to a breakdown. Okay? Always lead to a breakdown. Okay? Now, there are two things we must know about this pattern that God has uh, weaved into creation in order to be wise. Right? Two things. Okay? Firstly, there is a pattern in which God has weaved into his creation and that's what we've just established right god has weaved a pattern into creation and is we are wise if we know this pattern and we abide by it okay and secondly uh, secondly it might sound a bit contradicting uh contradictory uh, but hear me out okay secondly though there is a pattern we are unable to discern everything from this pattern okay in another sense uh, you cannot know it all uh, okay so there's an element that only God knows, and that is his secret will. Now, let, let me illustrate these two points uh, by looking at the structure of the book of Proverbs itself. So I'm taking a holistic thematic view uh, on how to understand Proverbs when we study it. Okay? Now, if we look at uh, chapters 1 to 9 of the book of Proverbs, they are like the introduction, hmm, chapters 1 to 9. Okay. But from chapters 10 to 15, uh, you will find uh, very short little proverbs or wise sayings, like one-liners and one every verse. Right? Now, what's interesting is that you see the principles by which life normally works. Right? This is called the pattern. Uh, the pattern that God weaves into creation. That's in from chapter 10 to chapter 15. Okay? The proverbs then lay out for us, and this is what they say to us. Right? Things like, if you work hard, you will prosper. Okay, pattern. Huh? If you are lazy, you'll be poor. Pattern again, right? You will live according to moral absolutes. Your life will go well. If you, you, you live a wicked life, uh, your life will not go well. Right? Uh, if you raise a child according to this pattern, if you raise a right child rightly, uh, when he or she grows old, she will love you and be a responsible adult. Right? This is the pattern there from Proverbs 10 to, to 15. Okay. Then when you get into chapter 16 onwards, huh, suddenly uh, you begin to see exceptions to these rules, to these patterns, these principles of how life normally works. For example, uh, there are a number of proverbs that say some people who live according to God's moral decrees, God's laws, they have a lousy life. Okay, And then it says some people uh, who, though they work hard, uh, stay poor because of oppression. Okay, and then it says some people raise their child just right, you know, with all the laws and teach them and all. And when they grow old, uh, they go off uh, and then they become ill-disciplined, right? So some will say, yeah, you see, Joe, this is the proof, right? Life is so messy. You can't predict anything. Yeah, but get this. Uh, what is what the book of Proverbs tell us? What is wisdom, right? If you will not admit that there is a pattern you have to submit to, if you want to make it all up your own rules, huh? Then it says, uh, you want to say that I want to determine what's right or wrong for me in my life. If you do that, the Bible says you are a fool. Okay, you are a fool. But if you think you can see the whole pattern, uh, 
the whole pattern like what they put in uh, Proverbs 10 to 15, then you are also a fool, okay? You are also a fool. So just look at the book of Proverbs, right? Remember Job's friends, right? Job is suffering. Everything has gone wrong in his life, right? Although the Bible says he's a righteous man, okay? His children has died, you know, his life has fallen apart, he has lost all his money. And Job's friends come to him and say, claiming they do know what has happened to Job. They all know Proverbs chapter 10 to 15. And they say the pattern, you know, oh, this is the way, you know. Uh, and they all read all those things and say, if you live morally, your life will go well, right? And they look at Job. Yeah, your life is like that because you must be sinning, Job. You must be doing something wrong, right? So that's why the book of Job is also considered a wisdom book, right? Because it tells us that if you think you know it all, you don't know it at all, right? So they are harsh. It's because of that. They are harsh. They are miserable comfort comforters, right? They are rigid. They are moralistic. They have, they have hold on to one end of the pattern stick, right? And they know there's a pattern, but they think they can see it all, the whole picture, okay? They think they can understand it all, and they know how life normally works, but they don't think that there's any exceptions to the way life normally works, all right? So that is the challenge of wisdom. Okay? Now, so there, if there's a pattern in the world, okay, we established right in God's word, right? Because uh, wisdom was there when God created the world and God created the world out of wisdom, right? And, uh, you know, if there's a pattern, then we are to discern that pattern. Yeah? And yet it, tell, it does not tell us the whole picture. Okay? So how do we then do we get wisdom? How do we then? So you see, uh, no proverb will give you the whole story, the whole picture about a subject. There are dozens of proverbs. Uh, they are all a little different perspective for each subject. Okay? So you have to look at them all together. But the problem is that if you look at the book of proverbs, right, you talk about friends, for example, it's all scattered you know, from one chapter to another chapter. It all jump. Uh, with, uh, then riches or wealth and it's all around. So what I've done is that I try to pull out all these common themes uh, and classify them. So it's a very painful process uh, uh, to prepare for this. So I look at different themes uh, and then see collectively what God's wisdom uh, words uh, tells us about different th themes in life. And that's how I came up with the five uh, themes uh, that I want to cover for this ETS. Lah. Okay, now, and it's meant, actually, the book of Proverbs was meant to be read in total, and then you go into communities, and you discuss for years and years, no? Mull about it, and then you read with your parents, meditate with your teachers, God's word, and eventually, under wise teachers and mentors, yeah, you will get wisdom. Lah. That's the main intention, actually. But, uh, yeah, but although I don't profess to be wise, lah, so I... I try. That's why, because I'm not wise, that's why I have to study the book of Proverbs. Lah. So that's why I've come up, uh, come up with, uh, you know, five life themes. Lah. So first one, the fear of the Lord, which we look today. Then we look at friends, we look at wor words, and look at work and wealth. Okay? And I want to share them with you. Lah, so we can see these to in totality, what God's word say. Now, so finally, uh, for our final, I uh, for our, you know, last segment for today, let's look at verses 22 to 20 uh, to 31 uh, uh, of chapter 8. Let's look at uh, verses 22 to 31. Now, you notice something different in the way, suddenly from the first chapter now, when you start going to verse 22, the, the way it's written, the, 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 the literary device changes. Do you notice that now uh, wisdom is now personified? Wisdom is defined as I, me, and my. An extract quality now turned into a person. Now, so the Bible is telling us something uh, down here, uh, that wisdom is not so much about mastering or memorizing a bunch of rules. Okay? It's not about or some secret knowledge that other people do not know, You're like how to trade, you know, trading secrets, stock market. You know, you know something that you get advantage, right? Some of us maybe have signed up for this ETS thinking, ah, maybe I can learn some rules and I can get, become more wise. But sorry to disappoint you. Huh? The Bible says that wisdom is not obtained by mastering or memorizing a bunch of rules. Right? It's a love relationship with wisdom. And that's why wisdom is personified as a person. Okay? Personified as a person. You need to desire wisdom like a love relationship. And this is very significant. Okay, 
That's why I put this as part of our, of our fundamental state, lay out the ground rules huh, before we go into Proverbs today. Now, so, but let's let's look at another another verse huh, in the book of Proverbs. Now, if you turn huh, your Bible huh, to chapter 2, if you turn to Bible chapter 2, verse 1, or to chapter 3, verse 1, okay, they both begin in the same way. Look at verse uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, It says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandment. And now uh, the word uh, my son uh, is used 23 times all the way through the book of Proverbs. 23 times. Okay, So what does it tell us? My son indicates uh, that these words are being spoken out of a relationship of love. Okay. This is a father speaking to a son. And in the first instance, most of these proverbs uh, would have been spoken by Solomon, right? Because chapter 1, verse 1 tells us, tells us that Solomon was the one that, 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 that wrote uh, quite a number of the uh, proverbs in this book. But later also, there are others also, you know, it was a compilation of others, other people who contributed to this also. So, but by and large, we know that it would have been spoken by Solomon. Okay, a loving father to his son Rehoboam. Okay, they come out and flow out of a relationship of love. So we must understand the context, ah, uh, in which in which uh, Proverbs is being taught, uh. So the wisdom of God, uh, is thus personified as a person. Okay, you can know and love. Okay, wisdom can be known and can be loved. And if you get into a relationship with this person, it will make you wise. Okay, we'll see that in friends, our friends next next session, right? How uh, when you walk with uh, wise friends, you become wise. And uh, when you walk with foolish people, you become foolish, right? So that's what the Proverbs is teaching us, you know, what's wisdom. So those words who maybe perhaps have never had the parents or never had the mentors or never had guides, uh, never had counselors, okay? You wonder then how can and how how then how can we uh, uh get wisdom? So the book of Proverbs here tells us uh, that this uh that there is an ultimate guide, an ultimate mentor, and, uh, and an ultimate counselor, which is known as the wonderful counselor. Okay, so now let me show it to you. Okay, now there are a lot of other wisdom literature in the ancient Israel, okay, besides the stuff we have in the Bible, okay. The other five wisdom books are just to just to let you know is that besides the book of Proverbs, uh, the Psalms are also known as classified as wisdom literature, the book of Job, the Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. Okay, these are the five wisdom books of the Bible. But besides that, there's an another uh, one of those pieces of literature from ancient Israel, which is called wisdom. It's called the wisdom of the son of Sirach. Okay. Uh, it's a good inter interesting book lah, because uh, last when I was a Roman Catholic when I was young, I had I was I was asked and taught to read this book. Lah. Okay, it's interesting. Uh, in it, uh, there's this interesting call and challenge, which I, I quoted for you in the slide here. Huh? So the son of Sirach says, Okay, look at this, huh? Turn unto me, you who are untaught. Why do you say you are lacking in these things? And why are your soul so thirsty. I say to you, find wisdom. Put your neck under its yoke and bear its burden. If you are intent, you can find wisdom. See with your eyes that I have labored for it and I have found for my soul much rest. Okay, much rest. Now that's a typical invitation to wisdom. Okay, but can you imagine, just imagine, huh? because this is ancient Israel, huh? their literature, they know their stuff. You just imagine uh, what how would the listeners feel uh, centuries later after this document that the wisdom of Sirach was written, right? One sage, one rabbi, or one teacher got up and said these words: Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now notice how similar those statements are that Jesus spoke uh, to, the, to the wisdom of Sirach. Okay? Look at it. And by look at it, uh, there's a lot. And also there are also astounding differences. Uh, okay? 
The son of Sirach says, get the yoke, which is training, right? Put, uh, get training. Put the, your yoke, uh, put your head in the yoke of training. Get discipline, get, uh, get the yoke. Get training and then you will get rest for your soul. Okay? Get training and then you get rest for your soul. But Jesus says, uh, come to me. Take my yoke, right? Come to me, right? He's the one, he's the wisdom. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me and I will give rest for your soul. So three conditions uh, that Jesus gave, uh, come, take, learn, okay? And then you will find rest for your soul, okay? It's not just coming to him, you must take and you must learn, okay? Now, do you know what Jesus is saying by when he said this? Or how the first century Jews, when they first heard Jesus saying this, what do you think they were thinking of? Okay. Uh, now he's saying uh, Jesus is actually saying this to them. Okay. I am wisdom in person. Okay. I am the wisdom of God. I am wisdom personified. A relationship with me will make you wise. Okay. Wisdom ultimately is not a body of knowledge to master, not a body of principles to memorize. It's knowing me, living for me, and learning from me is the only thing you can live for and learn from that won't exhaust you. And that's what Jesus is saying, right? That's what the first century Jews, when they heard this, understood what Jesus meant to, do, to say, okay? So, now we say, right? So, if wisdom is personified, if wisdom is a person, how do you get wisdom then, if it's a person? Now, two ways to help us, okay? Firstly, we have to recognize that wisdom, uh, firstly, the path of wisdom. Okay? Now, do you remember one of the most famous Proverbs? Right? Most of us can remember, cite it by heart in Proverbs 3, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, right? And then what's, what's next? You see, right? It says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Okay? Now, the Bible, uh, just notice this, uh, the Bible is constantly talking about life as a pathway. Life as a pathway. Now, in fact, there are seven or eight, 700 to 800 times in the Bible that living life, the, the Bible says, is likened to walking a path, like down a path. Now, why is that metaphor used? Why? Okay. First of all, uh, walking a path is basically accomplished by steady, repeated, even sometimes mundane or boring actions, right? It's just right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, left foot, right? Left, right, left, right, left, right. Very boring, repeated, steady. Things that are fairly easy to do, right? As long as you do them over and over and over again, you, you will get somewhere to your destination. Who you become, your final destiny, is basically a product of how you do the little things in your daily life, your little choices, your little attitudes, the basic disciplines, the things you spend your time doing every day. It's not the dramatic event, life events that are not the turning point. And it's not the turning point. You know? It's really the small things you do in your life. Okay, So when therefore, when the Bible say that wisdom, uh, the Bible calls wisdom a pathway, uh, a pathway. When it talks about the way of wisdom, the path of wisdom, what it means is that you become wise by assuming a certain set of daily practices, a certain set of daily practices, okay? By taking upon yourself certain set of daily repeated disciplines, things you're going to, going to do over and over again, okay? And if you do it over and over again, uh, okay, eventually you will become a wise person, all right? Now, wisdom in the Bible is a pathway uh, and it's not a door, okay? The door image would be, here's a door, right? And if I turn the latch, if I do it, if I have the right key, I turn it, the key, I walk in there, I become wise. But the Bible never says such things about wisdom. The Bible never says wisdom is a door, okay? But and that if you get the secret knowledge, if you get no information or you have a certain experience, you'll be wise. Never, okay? Wisdom is a path, right? So it means it's a long Patient quest uh, over and over and over again, doing simple, simple things every day and out, left, right, left, right, left, right, over a long period of time. And wisdom, therefore, can never happen very quickly. It's not like, wow, you attend one course, one seminar, you can, right? Now, but here's the thing, right? In the world today, what does the world tell us? If you go to any bookshop, 
Okay, now maybe online store, a lot, lot of bookshops closed in Singapore already, right? Physical or online, okay? You can find, easily find certain sections where you're going to give you uh, books after books after books about, or oh, give you three lessons, five steps, ten ways, or maybe a set of six CDs on how to overcome your shyness, how to become confident, how to be successful in your work, your career, how to handle trouble, how to deal with stress, how to overcome anxieties, how to have a decent love life, and all that kind of stuff, right? Three CDs, a seminar, a workshop, 200, 2,000, 3,000, read a book, you know? Now, can you see what the world thinks of wisdom? Okay, just think of it. In other words, uh, the world tells you that wisdom is a door. You just turn the latch, you'll just do it. You just need some techniques, you just can do it. But the Bible says it's not, right? You can't get these things that fast, okay? Because wisdom is a path. And wisdom, if it's personified, wisdom is a relationship, right? You need to have that. We Christians, even sometimes conservative ones, uh, have also been very influenced by the world, right? I, can, I can't quite remember. I, can, I just remember how many times people have come up to me uh, and say, you know, Pastor, I want to talk to you because I'm trying to find out God's will in my life. I'm sure Pastor Gunn also had this experience, right? People come to you and say, hey, help me, Pastor. I want to find out God's will in my life. What they usually mean is that I have a big question, right? I have a big decision to make. Okay. Should I marry this person? Should I break up with this person? Should I move into this country? Should I go into this job? Should I take up this career? I'm trying to discern God's will. Okay. Now, I will usually say, I don't know what Pastor Gunn will do, lah, but I will say, okay, well, uh, what are you doing now? Huh? What are you doing? Uh, then some will tell me, when I pray about this, doing this, I don't have peace. But when I pray about doing something, other things, huh, I have peace. Now, is this what God is telling me? Wouldn't that be the way how I could tell that God is uh, leading me to go into that direction as long as I feel at peace? Now, I'm sure you have heard some of your friends have said this before also, right? We hear this in AGPC as well, right? Some will say, I'm asking God for a sign. And when this happens last week, I thought that maybe that was a sign that God is trying to tell me, right? So we try to spiritualize all this. Now, I had at that time, uh, I had a, a, a wife shared with me how he, she discerned God's will uh, for her terminally ill husband who was battling an aggressive form of cancer during his last stage of his life, uh. She's not really a praying person. Eh? She don't usually pray. Eh? And uh, she was just a new new convert. But after attending an all-night prayer watch, eh, out of a desperation to get her husband healed, eh, uh, while she was walking to the coffee shop to have a breakfast, she walked past a shop, eh, a retail shop, which has a T-shirt sign eh, with a victory sign, you know, a V sign down there. And then she discerned, wow, it's from God telling her that her husband would be well again. But then that very week, the husband passed away. Lah, okay? Now, some, some people say also tell me, you know, I pray and then I open up my Bible and then I just close my eyes and point at the verse. Ah, this is the will, the will of God. Is that the way, right? Well, when people say I'm looking for a sign, I want, to, I want some peace. I don't have any peace. That can't be right unless I get peace. I must get peace before I know that's God's will. I would tell them, lah, okay, in a sense that, yeah, you know, God has given you a brain. Make a decision, okay? Don't sit around trying to guess what God's will. You have a brain. Make a decision, okay? They will look at me sometimes in the face, although they won't say, lah, you know, I can see in their face. They say, hey, pastor, ah, I'm trying to be spiritual. I'm trying to be holy here. Lah. Why you give me all such a secular kind of thing? Uh, advice. But my response to all this is that, no, actually, you are looking for a technique, okay? You're looking for a technique. You're trying to make a decision without having wisdom. Okay? Maybe you don't have wisdom, but that's your fault, right? Because you're looking for a technique. You're saying, how do I discern? Okay? If you have been doing it right, if you, let me tell you, if you have been doing left, right, left, right, left, right, all, all these years, uh, which the Bible says is how we get God's guidance, right? After a period of time, you, be the, you become the kind of person, uh, wise person, who know how to make the right choice okay in the absence of rules okay there are no other forms of guide guidance there's no shortcut there's no it's a path okay no shortcut not a door not a latch not a key okay so i've heard other people come and say you know i've been a very good person 
I live morally. I go to church. I pray and all that. I say my prayers every day. And my life isn't going the way that it should. And that's not fair, you know, Pastor How. Do you know what they have done by saying this, right? In other words, you're saying, I've been more, I've been moral, I've been good, huh? I push all the so-called holy and right buttons. Okay. I pray every day, I push that button. I go to church, I push that button. And I and out, out of this, huh, I should have a good life. And they've turned their morality huh, into a technique. Okay. They've turned their prayer into a technique. Okay. Just like those synchronized prayers you know sometimes people say right if everyone prays at a certain time uh, all together god has no choice but to answer no because it's a technique uh, okay now come on friends okay unless you understand that wisdom is a path and the way god works in your life the way god guides you is by left right left right left right walking with him all the while uh, doing certain practices day in, day out, reading, meditating on his word and chewing on it and all that stuff. Eventually, you'll be the wise person and you will know how to make the right choice. Okay, There's no shortcut. Wisdom is a path and that's what the Bible tells us. Okay, Now, what are those practices, the daily practices we need to do? I kind of alluded to them, right? What is the left, right, left, right? right? What's the daily repeated things that we do? Yeah, it is in following wisdom personified in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Knowing Him, uh, reading about Him, meditating about Him, for He has invited us, right, to come to Him, follow Him, and He will make us fishers of men. Okay, so it's in our daily reading of God's Word, reflecting and praying, even though nothing seems to be happening immediately. All this. This left, right, left, right, left, right uh, shapes us to become more and more like Jesus, okay? Who is wisdom personified, okay? That's what uh, the, the first thing, right? And the Bible tells us uh, that our character is fixed and determined not by the dramatic events, but more so by the daily choices you make, right? The left, right, left, right, left, right, okay? That's what fixes your character, now, I remember uh, a story that Tim Keller, Pastor Tim Keller, the late Tim Keller, gave a uh, shared in a sermon about an interview he read uh, about a man in the jail. Uh, okay? He was telling the story about this, his life uh, in this interview. And Tim Keller told us, uh, he told a story about how when this man who's in the jail, uh, when he was a young boy, his father had his wonderful gold watch, which he loved. Uh, the father had a lot, love, love, love this gold watch. And so one day, this boy, uh, this man, uh, when he was a boy, sneaked into his father's room and took the watch and out of his father's drawer. And he was playing with it and looking at it. And then suddenly, he dropped it and it cracked. And, uh, in fear, the boy put back the, the, the watch in the drawer and said nothing. And when the father found out, uh, he called everyone, uh, uh, the family uh, together and said, who did this? Okay, Who did this? The boy did not say because... He had always, be as before, had the instinct to cover up. He doesn't want to admit. Right? He didn't cover up. He didn't tell the truth. He wasn't truthful and he always covered up. So years later, because he was doing this uh, as a left, right, left, right, eh, cover up. Years later, one night, uh, when he was driving a car on a dark road, he ran over a little boy. Okay? In an instant, he left the scene. Okay? By instinct, he fled. When he got home, he realized what he had done. And he was too afraid to turn himself in, okay, because he was a hit and run, okay. They eventually found it, found out, found him out, and he was in jail for years, okay. And they eventually, uh, and then most of the rest of uh, for for the rest of his life, lah, okay. And they interviewed him, and he said, nah, in the interview, what fixed his destiny, uh, was not the de decision that when he made on the road. It was the little decisions he had made, been making for years and years and years. Okay? His character was already set in place. So he did what he had become. Okay? So it's not the big events, it's, but it's the daily little choices that we make that fixes our character and also your destiny. So we have to be careful huh, in our daily choices. The only way we can we can know uh, that we are walking right, uh, left, right, left, right, is to really examine ourselves. And that is 
the only way to examine yourself is to meditate on his word and read his Bible and you meditate on your, your yourself. And that's how you know, right? We have ex an example of a particular path like this in Proverbs chapter 4, which I just uh, replicated for us. But if you want, you can turn your Bible now to Pro Proverbs chapter 4. Okay, you look at it. We are going to look at verse 11 to 19 here. Okay, look at verse 14. Verse 14. Okay. Notice in the beginning of a pathway, you're in control, right? You have a choice in the beginning of the pathway. It says, right, do not set your foot on the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil, right? Avoid it. Turn from it. Okay. The assumption here is that in the beginning of the path, uh, you, can, you can choose. Okay. You can decide to do it or not, right? Okay. In the beginning. But look at what happens to people further down the path. If you walk left, right, left, right, left, right down the path. Look at verse 16. What happens? For they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. Now that's, that's a language of addiction. Okay, Obsession or drive, drivenness. Right? They want to go to sleep but they can't sleep because Someone has gotten ahead of them. You know, someone is doing better than them. Someone has more money, more acclaim, more power and everything, all that stuff, right? So when you choose your path, you got to be very careful, right? At the beginning of the path, you have a choice. And what you choose will determine uh, your destiny, okay? And by the way, uh, if there's anyone right now, any group of people, anybody uh, here, would just love to see another person humiliated, love to see someone brought down, you might be on this path, okay? This path of evil, okay? Now, what is this addiction? It's an addiction to yourself, okay? An addiction to self-centeredness, right? It's comparing yourself with others, if you think about it, right? Now, it's interesting. It's, it's needing to bring others down, right? So that you can be exalted, right? The addiction of self-centeredness and self-absorption. And it runs against, against the greatest commandment that our Lord has given to us, right? That is to love God and to love our neighbors right the more often and the more intensely we go through our day you know something as mundane uh, as i'm not as good as that person you keep on comparing yourself you know that kind of stuff you do this on a left right left right basis uh, you'll be more and more fixated with yourself right you will just think about yourself you may you may not think of it consciously but the more often you operate like that in your life on the basis of Oh, I'm not as good as this person or I'm better than this person and all that stuff, comparing yourself with others, okay? Uh, then the more addicted you are to your own ego, okay? So self-centeredness is all about you if you continue with this path. So that's why the Bible say, uh, in this, same, this same proverb, uh, Proverb 4 says, the primary thing is to put them in your heart, right? Keep in your heart with all vigilance. Look at verse 23, right? Above all else, guard your heart. And that's what the Bible always tells us. You cannot change your life by trying to work on your will. You know, I want my, my determination, you know, that kind of stuff. Because Augustine said, uh, the key to changes in life uh, is not the acts of your will. That means whether you're determined, whether you're resolute, you know. Like, so that's why verse 23 says, right, the heart is the wellspring of life. And that tells us a lot, right? The heart is a wellspring of life. Because firstly, it tells us, right, one, one first and foremost is that a spring is not a pool. Huh? A spring is not a pool. A spring is an outflowing, an outgushing of streams of water. So things are coming out of our heart. The heart is a spring. So when you see the word heart in the Bible, uh, you know uh, it's not talking about your organ or your heart. It doesn't say it's a well, uh, it, but it's the center of your will. You know what generates your motivations and everything, right? It doesn't say your uh, it's a wellspring of emotion. It's a wellspring of life, you know, not only emotions, your life. The Bible says, what it's trying to say here is that what's in your heart determines not just your feelings, but your actions and your thinking and the way you perceive things, how you look at things as well. Everything in your life comes from what happens in your heart. And that that actually is all shaped by your left, right, left, right, left, right. Right? Can you see how important it is? That's why the Bible talks about wisdom first and foremost. Huh? Starts with this as a path, right? It's a left, right, left, right thing. And it's a personal relationship by walking with God. Right? Now, notice the rest of the passage huh, in uh, Proverbs chapter 4. 
once you get your heart right, uh, you once you get your truth, once you get the truth in your heart, true left, right, left, right, daily meditating of your of God's word, then you can look at what you say. Okay, verse 24. Then you will notice your eyes, how you view things. Verse 25. Okay. Then you will look at your behavior, your actions. Verse 26, 27. But the first of all, the primacy is your heart. Everything flows out of your heart. So your heart determines what you see, what you think, and how you behave. Why? Because your heart is what you believe you must have in order to receive life joyfully. And that's why Proverbs warns us of that. And that's where this gives us a very uh, 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 a natural segue into the next part, the fear of the Lord. Okay, Why the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? So this is the last point I want to get uh, on how we can get wisdom if it's personified as a person. And it's the focus on what the book of Proverbs refer to as the first step to the journey of wisdom. The very first step okay, to this journey. What is also reflected in other parts, uh, like in verse uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, and chapter 15, verse 33, let's turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 9, uh, verse 10 here. Okay, This is where wisdom begins, right? It's a very clear statement here. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I wonder how many of us, I mean, what is your first reaction to the phrase, the fear of the Lord? Okay. There are many, some of us here who, which might be inclined to say, I don't want to have anything to do with fear, you know. I had somebody before like, in, a, in a mega church tell me, hey, no, no, no that's an Old Testament thinking, you know, just the under law, uh, under law. But under grace, we don't talk about the fear of the Lord. But that is a very a wrong understanding of what the Bible tells us, right? Now, does the Bible say perfect love? Then they will say, right? Does the Bible say perfect love cast out all fear? I want to go with love. I don't want to have anything to do with fear, right? And then why? Why does it say that? And if you have endured religion based on fear, because sometimes some of us were brought up uh, in a sense of fear religion, right? You must do this, you must do that, or else God will punish you, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I can understand then, obviously, you are adverse to these verses like that. But before you switch off, right, when you, but you see the word fear here, I just want to ask that you suspend all judgment and try to hear me out, huh? to look at the good that is promised here in order you may be able to discover something wonderfully new which you might not have seen before about the fear of the Lord. Okay, Now, let me first describe the good out of the fear of the Lord, okay, we, we, that the Lord brings, huh? the fear of the Lord brings. And I like to, and then I like to define for you what does it mean, okay? But we are not going to be interested in what, uh, what the fear of the Lord means unless we know that there's some benefit and some good, okay, in store for us. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, in other words, what it means actually is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of following Jesus Christ, right? Is that important, you see? Because this is where following Jesus begins. Okay? And all the blessing of wisdom, as we have seen before already uh, in the introduction, where they all begin? They all begin, uh, all begin from the fear of the Lord. And the only thing, uh, only and only this is where wisdom is found. Okay? And it's also where strength is found as well. Now look at chapter 16, verse 6. By the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Fear of the Lord turns you away from evil. Now, that's a wonderful statement, isn't it? Remember that this is the Lord, the, like a father, speaking to his children. Right? If you are a child of God, you would have a sense and desire to want to get rid of those sins that cling so closely to your heart. Right? And the question that runs through your mind okay, uh, is this, right? Is how can I do this? How can I get rid of all this sin? Okay, and the answer is right here. By the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. So this is where we get the strength to do it, right? So this is the benefit of the fear of the Lord, right? This is what it gives you strength. Okay, this is what it makes it possible for you to overcome particular sins in your life and temptations you have been grappling with. Okay, it's the fear of the Lord. Okay, by this. 
be, you will secure your life. You'll be able to turn away from evil. Just like what Moses said back there in the desert, right? To God's people. The fear of the Lord will keep you from sinning. Uh, that's in Exodus chapter 20, verse 20. Exodus chapter 20 verse, 20, uh, verse 20. The fear of the Lord will keep you from sinning. And that's also what we are being told here in Proverbs as well. Okay, So this is not only where wisdom is found. Okay, It's also where strength is found. Strength is found. And if that is not enough, that is where Proverbs tells us where life is found. Life. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. So if this is where wisdom is found, this is where strength is found, and this is where my life is found, I want more of this fear, isn't it? Of course I want more of this fear in my life. I don't want less of it, but I want more of it. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's going to give me strength in my struggle against sin and temptation, and it's the fountain of life. Okay? Now, then... Having seen the benefits of the fear of the Lord, what then is the, the definition? What does it mean to fear the Lord, right? I want much of it as possible in my life if it brings all this good stuff, right? And it's simply this, uh, the fear of the Lord is simply this. Let me give you a definition I got uh, from this guy uh, by the name of John Brown. He was a pastor many, many centuries ago. And he says, uh, the fear of the Lord means so to love him that his frown, his frown uh, would be your greatest dread and his smile your greatest delight. And that's what the fear of the Lord is. It is so is to so love the Lord that his frown uh, is the thing that you would dread most in this world. I love him, right? I don't want him to be displeased with me. And his smile is my greatest delight. Just imagine, well done, good and faithful servant. That's my greatest joy, right? The joy, goodest joy is, right? So that's where what the fear of the Lord is, okay? You think the person you love most in this world, just think of it, right? And how you would hate to ever make that person upset, okay? You would tremble at the thought of the person you love the most, right? And making him hurt or her hurt. See then that there's a fear, that fear that love removes, right? We can see that uh, there's a fear that love removes. Okay? And there's a fear that love brings. Okay? So the fear that love removes is the fear of rejection or condemnation. Okay? That's why when John says, perfect love casts out all fears, it's the fear of rejection, a fear of condemnation. Okay? Perfect love casts out all fears. Now, no, there's no fear of condemnation when we know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That's why I say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of following Jesus, okay? But there's a fear that love brings and the love that, that the love brings is the trembling that least we, we, we should hurt or wound the one that we have grown to love so much. And that is the other fear, okay? Now, lastly, right? Now, when question, now then the question now some of us might be thinking, right? If, if uh, where then do I get this fear of the Lord? You know, maybe now I don't feel that fear, you know? How can I cultivate that fear? Okay. Where do I come to the place when I, uh, where I am now, starting right now in my life? Okay. This is where I'm going to love. I want to love the Lord like that. How am I going to do that? And the answer of, the, of cultivating that kind of love uh, for the Lord is birth and the cross. Okay. David puts it this way in Psalm 130 verse 4. With you, he says to the Lord, uh, David says, uh, Psalm 130 verse 4. With you, there is forgiveness, so that you may be feared. Uh, very strange. Huh? I find that's one of the re most remarkable statements in scriptures, uh, in the, the Bible. You might expect David to say to the Lord, no? with your forgiveness, there's no more fear. There's no more fear. That's a profound sense in which it might be true, right? Because when you're forgiven, you won't fear condemnation. Perfect love comes out all fear. There's no more fear of condemnation for those who are in Christ. But here, David says, uh, in this very important verse is, with you there is forgiveness, so that you may be feared. Okay? In other words, uh, your forgiveness brings me into this. And that's why 
right? The cross, the birth, you know, the, the love of the Lord, uh, the fear of the Lord begins at the cross. If we recognize what the cross has brought to us in our life, right? So we say that, you no, know, we come, we look and meditate on the cross. We say, Lord, I see that your forgiveness has come to me at such a cost that I would tremble ever to wound a love like this. The fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom is birthed at the cross, right? Whereas a forgiven sinner, knowing the grace and mercy that you are yours in Jesus Christ, you come to say, how can I ever resist a love like this? Okay? And that's the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of wisdom. Uh, that's the beginning of strength. And that's the beginning of life, right? new life. Okay? So, the, so to love the Lord that his frown would be your greatest dread and his smile your greatest joy and greatest delight. So in the coming weeks, we are going to look at what a life of wisdom is like, a life of following Jesus, a life of, that begins with this kind of love for the Lord, the fear of the Lord, right? The fear of the Lord and what, what it looks like, right? In relation to your friends, what it looks like, I fear the Lord, in relation to, to your words, in relation to your work, in relation to your wealth, okay? We are going to come to the book of Proverbs knowing that Jesus Christ himself is our wisdom, okay? And that all wisdom and knowledge are found in him, okay? So this thing, just think about this as we anticipate these practical areas, okay? Friendship. Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother, okay? He will give you the wisdom as you walk with him through his word. Okay? That you need to be a good friend to others. Because he's such a good friend to you, you can be that kind of friend to others as well. Okay? That's what it means to be a friend. Okay? Okay, right now, okay, uh, Jesus is bringing many uh, sons to glory. So as you walk with Jesus, the wisdom of God, he will give you the wisdom for raising your children as well and your family as well, right? So Jesus speaks the word of life, okay? So as you walk with him, okay, as you fear the Lord, right? And you, that's why you walk with him in his word. You will find he is able to give you the wisdom, uh, wisdom so that your words will become life-giving and not words that tear down the lives of others, okay? Christ has fulfilled all the work that the Father has given him. To do as you walk with him, he will teach you through his wisdom what it takes for you to do all that work that God has given to you. Okay, that's work. You will find the way of wisdom to do it as you walk with Christ. Now, the wisdom of God in the word, the word of God in the power of the Spirit. Now, as Jesus gave himself freely for us, therefore, as uh, therefore he as we as we walk with him. He will give us the wisdom to know that it is He that uh, is that we should give back to Him. Okay, so that's where we are going. I just want to challenge you this evening to begin this very moment by crowning Jesus as the Lord of your whole life. Okay, as the best verse, known verse in the book of Proverbs puts it, right? In all your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. So, will you join me in making? a new commitment to walk in the way of wisdom, which is to follow hard after Jesus Christ, right? And so to love him, that his frown will be your greatest dread and his smile will be your greatest delight. Begin at the cross as God's word takes us there, okay? Try to take in afresh the son of God who loves us and gave himself for you, each one of you, that with him there is forgiveness that all that is past, right? And then let his mercy birth in you. That is the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of discipleship, and the beginning of life. All right? Okay, that's all I have for you in this session. Wow, okay. Let us, uh, can I just lead us in this prayer first? Uh, then I can open up for uh, uh, comments or discussions or something, okay? Shall we? Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's commit this to prayer. Thank you, Father, for making us wise to where wisdom is Jesus. Wisdom is and is Jesus. Now make us wise in knowing him. Show us as a community how to use him, see him, know him, love him to make us wise 
Because I know, we know, that's what you want us to be and do. So we pray, Lord, you would help us as the years go by um, uh, to grow more and more into wisdom and to the, into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Okay. Any comments or any questions from anybody? Have I gone too fast? Oh, Constance, uh, you got something? Oh, no. Anybody has anything? Questions, comments, insights you want to share? Reverend Gunn, you want to say anything? No, yeah, I want to comment on the journal that you have provided. It was so uh, very helpful, and I hope that all who attend the lesson tonight will follow up with the journal that Pastor Joe has prepared. It's so detailed, I think it's going to be a good reinforcement for what we are learning tonight. So I think please do, I think he has, Pastor Joe has spent a lot of time preparing the journal, day one to day six until we meet next Wednesday. So yeah. please, if you want to learn deeper and more about wisdom, please use the journal starting from tomorrow. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Gan. Anybody, anybody? Uh, I'm very clear or maybe that you I lost your all. You've got nothing to say. <laughs> Don't know what to ask or so. Can you hear me? Ah uh, yes, yes, John. <laughs> no, I just want to say thank you for the session. I think it's a very, very good introduction um, to attaining wisdom. Okay. Uh, very clear to me. I think you have been the, the pace and all that is great. Okay. Uh, I took a, a whole page of notes already, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, all right. I think that's one of the challenge, right? Because every time the the worldly the world the world's definition of wisdom, we always acquainted to it, right? Some secret formula. I like. I used to go into the book of wisdom to think that I can learn some secret formulas there, and memorize it, and then that's it. My my life will I'll be a wise person. But after having studied the, the book of wisdom much clearer, very carefully, uh, you find it's very Christ centered, right? It's always pointing to Christ, who is our wisdom, and that's why you know I just just yeah I thought it'd be a very life giving thing to share what I've learned uh, on the book of wisdom. Anybody else? Any thoughts? I think for me the um, hi Moses. It's a it's a it's a good reminder actually. I mean for me it's, it's more like a reminder. Okay. Uh, it's not it's not an, anything new, but it's it's more like a reminder. Okay. Sure. Um, because as we as we go deeper into the into God's word, sometimes we forget the basics. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that, I... is, that is why this is why this kind of uh, this kind of uh, this kind of Bible study does give us the the, the reminder and the, the importance of it too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Adele. I see your hand. You wanna say? Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Thank you for your yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question on the part of the asking God for signs and then mm. how he's actually just searching for a technique for wisdom mm. so i was wondering like is there ever a circumstances like where it's like okay to still ask for signs from god because i have a lot of friends who are like yeah who are very spiritual in that way mm -hmm. okay, i was mm. just wondering okay i think i i i instead i always try to use the bible right as our book of wisdom right so you find that in uh, a case of course in old testament we have a case of gideon right asking for signs right you're actually testing god lah asking testing God and, and I think God in his mercy and his compassion uh, was condescending uh, to 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 encourage with uh, Gideon he was a very discouraged person he needed um, the encouragement to affirmation to do the things that he does uh. but I don't think this is something that we should emulate uh, okay because uh, why I say that is because in the New Testament Jesus was approached by some of the Pharisees and the religious leaders right Ask him to show him signs. And remember what he said? He scolded them, you know. He said, you adulterous, adulterous generation asking for signs. My goodness. We, we, I, think, I think it's very clear uh, from our Lord's uh, words, uh, you know, in that sense. Sometimes signs are, uh, I mean, of course, because, you know, uh, based on where we are, we are frail and all that stuff. You know, our faith is not as strong as it should. But I think uh, that's I think that's what it means to walk in faith, not in sight, lah. Okay. Sometimes signs are also another form of walking in sight rather than in faith, lah. 
I used to always uh, been when I was younger, I used to be asking for signs like that also. So I'm guilty, yeah, okay. And I realized there are certain things I've been praying, praying long, long, long time, you know, and asking for God for signs. And then suddenly in one of my silent retreats after many years, and then God, I heard a still small voice from God telling me, uh, what more do you want me to say to you? Whatever I have to say, I've already written my book. Why are you not looking at it? Why are you looking for signs, right? You're lazy or what? So from there, after that, I realized I repented huh? and I said, okay, I need to learn the word of God very clearly, uh, closely. And that's why I embrace it with all my life. Lah. Okay. Thanks, Adele. Thanks for that. For that, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Pastor yes, Vivian Vivian. here. Yes, Vivian. yeah. Okay, I just want to say a few. Uh, very encouraged. Okay. Uh, actually, I uh, have a upcoming uh, uh interview in a few weeks, and mm. today I pray for wisdom. Mm. Uh, but um, what you said uh just uh earlier about us um not focusing on on ourselves. Uh, uh, because that will be feeding our ego. I thought that um, although it's not new, but in a, when phrased in this way, it's new for me. So mm -hmm. it's a very timely reminder, and I feel it's also God's answer to me mm -hmm. uh, to say in another way to focus on Him. So mm -hmm. I I, I want to share that I feel very encouraged this Thank evening. You, Thank you. Thanks for encouraging all of us. Right, all of us. We need. We are all. Uh, need. To, we need, all need to be encouraged. Uh. Thank you so much for your testimony and being vulnerable. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anybody else? Any any other thoughts? Hi, Preacher Joe Alfred. Yeah? Hey, Alfred. Hey, Xiao Chang. You quoted from the book of Shira, and ah. I was not familiar with it. Ah. But then it is good that you connected the dots uh -huh. that Jesus says his yoke is light. Mm. So, so, so that's why I thought, hey, it was a good connection rather than mm. just... Uh, quoting from Sirat, which most of us are not familiar with. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I think one of the things, that's why when Jesus says, come to me, all you labor, and then take my yoke, right? And then it's a very interesting analogy as well. Because if you've seen a yoke, right, it's usually yoke with two animals. Okay. Now, if you walk in the same pathway, uh, uh, there is, you can have a lot of productivity, uh, but when we try to try and move a different pathway from Jesus when you're yoked with him, uh, you find you cannot get anywhere, right? And you struggle. You don't, but you won't get rest, right? So that's why people always say, you know, come to me. That's why people sometimes take only at the come to me part, you know, go to Jesus, you know, that kind of stuff. But the second part is take my yoke, right? You must be burdened by, you must follow Jesus. And that's where you get the path of wisdom. Because if wisdom is personified in the person of Jesus, we have to be yoked to him. We have to follow him, right? And so I was trying to give a, a, a way uh, to understand how does the first century uh, Jews, uh, when he first heard when Jesus said that, what does it mean to them? They immediately know the, the message uh, that he's personified as wisdom. Wisdom made man, right? That's the kind of thing. Thanks, thanks, Xiao Chang. Anybody else? Hi, Kenneth. Resigns, but aren't signs also a way of God talking to us or guide us? Yes, there are times, I mean, in the Bible and all that stuff, we, we don't want to put God in a box, right? Uh, definitely, God God do talk to us also in signs, sometimes in dreams and everything, right? We don't say that no more, right? The Bible never say that. Uh, but here again, uh, what wisdom tells us that actually we cannot run away from the fact that if you want, you want, if you want guidance, you know, you want to... To, to walk in the character of, of, of a son of, or daughter of God, then naturally it's really that ongoing relationship that will then bring to bear the kind of decisions that you make like, in that sense. Of course, this one-off thing, science and all, God sometimes condescend, right? Uh, sometimes what Gideon did, did uh, in the book of uh, Judges, right? Uh, we, we, some people will think that, hey, that's the way, you know, I keep on putting my fleece and ask God for signs and all that stuff. But really, that's what we have to put into perspective. We have to take the whole Bible, right? Sometimes, even though, like, say, for example, God says you honor, you know, one man, one woman, and all that stuff. And then, in the case that you find in Old Testament, you have people with polygamy, right? Having more, uh, you know, like David, have so many wives. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, that is condoned. Right? I mean, that God, God is pleased with it, right? It doesn't mean that way, right? But it shows, right? When you have so many wives, what happens? 
you get a miserable life. That's not wise. All right, that's not wise. So we have to really read and discern uh, the whole counsel of God in that sense. So while in the case of Gideon, right, God gave him signs and some other some other uh, characters have God gave them signs, but it's really a, con a, a concession. Uh. The other thing is that the more important thing is that, you know, we need to uh, walk by faith and not by sight. Lah, and that's the perp that's the, the the teaching of our Lord himself, lah, which, he, which he clarifies, uh, which I cited earlier. Lah. All right. Thanks, Kenneth. Uh, Pastor Joe, just add a few things on this. Yeah, huh? yeah, sure, sure, Stephen. So, uh, I think it's good. I think uh, you may use the word concession. That's important. Mm. Uh, God knows our heart. If we are asking him not to test him, but yeah. sincerely seeking his will, I believe God will respond. Just like when the disciples, remember on the yeah. Matthew 24, when before Jesus was uh, uh, crucified, what, what did they ask Jesus? Ask for the signs of his yeah. second coming. So yeah. he did respond to that when they asked out of a heart of sincerity. They are really concerned. They want to know where what will be the sign that we should be looking for when you are coming back again. So he gave a long list of signs in Matthew 24, if you mm. were to read all of them. So the Lord did give us if we will answer us if we ask from a heart of sincerity. Uh, recently in our Thai, uh, Thailand trip, we have been having small fellowship and heard of a sister who shared asking for sign to confirm that the person that she is going out with, courting with, is really indeed the husband-to-be. And God showed her the sign, right? Uh, and because she is desperately seeking God's will, don't want to get into the wrong person, marrying to the wrong man. And and it is her to her, her personal testimony and, and, and experience with God. So I would say that as Pastor Joe earlier answered when the when the when people ask to test the Lord Jesus, Jesus scolded them because they asked for the sign of him being the son of God as the son of God. He said there will be no sign except the sign of Jonah. So he scolded them because the Pharisee were testing him to trap to, to, to trap him, right? But if we are asking out of desperation, out of sincerity to do the right thing, to bring him glory, to bring him honor, I believe he will help us and show us clearly. And of course, I must qualify that. That's assuming you have a deep, intimate relationship with God and you know the Bible well. Because as Pastor Joe mentioned today, he quoted one verse, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, right? He trusts in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on the own insight. In all your way, you acknowledge him. What will he do? He will make straight your path. And also, I think some, uh, I can't remember the, the verse. It's Psalm 119105. Say what? Your word is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. So if you know the word of God well, you will hear clearly when he speaks and when he prompts. Uh. So mm. that's my take on this, uh, Pastor Joe, just, uh, mm. just to add on. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Anybody else? You got a little bit more time. Last question. You know, you don't ask, you tonight cannot sleep. Nobody, ah. Uh? No more going once, going twice. Okay, I tell you what, uh, anyway, for every week, uh, we'll try to start. I mean, the, the session will open at 7.45. If you have any burning questions, you feel shy, you know, too many people here, you know, we can come, you can come in earlier, la, I'll be available and we can mm. have a dialogue, la, chat a bit, okay, before we start the session also. Yeah, that'd be great, yeah. Yeah, okay. If not, thank you. It leaves me to just thank everybody for turning up. Uh, it's been enjoyable uh, learning the, 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 the word of the Lord together. Okay. If not, thank you very much. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.